Hi again, everyone, and welcome to the latest installment of the Port View webinar series. My name is Colin Parker, and I'll be your moderator for today's webinar, uh, Search Engine Optimization for Dynamic Websites, with Ken Colburn, who is our lead SEO here at Port uh, We'd love it if you guys would all join in on this webinar. There are a couple of ways you can do that. Uh, one is by asking your questions within the questions pane of GoToWebinar, and the other is by tweeting your questions using the hashtag PortentU, so that's hash Portent, P-O-R-T-E-N-T, U. And just so you all know, in case you miss out on any of today's webinar or you want to review it later with a dev team or with your marketing team, don't worry because tomorrow you'll actually get a follow-up email with uh, all of the links uh, from this webinar and a link to the actual recording itself. Uh, we'll also include in that a slide share link to all of the presentation slides. Uh, since Bitly recently discontinued their link bundle feature, again, uh, you'll be able to get all of those links uh, in Ken's follow-up blog post if you miss that email. So without further ado, uh, please join me in welcoming Ken. Hey, Ken. Hello. All right. Welcome, everyone. So um, just want to do a kind of a brief introduction to myself here. So and important. So I work at Porton here uh, in beautiful Seattle. It's a nice sunny day today. Uh, so we're excited about that. Um, I am Ken Colborn, the SEO team lead. I've worked for Porton for the last two years or so, and I've been doing SEO for about seven years, but I've been working on various aspects of the web uh, for the last 16 or so years. Um, I've been started out as a web designer, then worked my way into programming. And so I have a, a great deal of technical background uh, in websites. And then also I love everything to do about analytics. Uh, I, I'm in at least Google Analytics at least once a day, checking on different uh, metrics, and I love going in there to, to find out how people are using the site. Um, so it, uh, that part's great. And a uh, little known fact, uh, I also am geeky enough to learn, have learned how to ride a unicycle. So that was back in my early teen years, I thought that was the cool thing to do. Little to my knowledge at that point, uh, it didn't work so, uh, so well for my social uh, life. But now we gotta go on with the rest of this. So wanted to talk about optimi optimizing dynamic web websites. And you might ask, okay, why, why this subject? And you know, the, the big thing is, I, as I said, I've been working with SEO for you know, a while now. And um, it's something that I've seen a lot, especially as Ajax, uh, you know, first started, you know, the, you know, this bringing dynamic content to us. And I've, I've run into it a lot, you know, over the years with different clients having issues. And recently in the last, you know, probably year, year and a half, I've ran into more and more uh, people coming to us with issues. It, it seems like nowadays um, it's like every other site I I look at has um, ha has the uh, you know uses some sort of dynamic content. And you know first I want to kind of talk about you know for those that don't know what is a dynamic website. And my definition is is it's pretty simple. You know, first you have when the browser loads a page, and this is the HTML page, HTML that is actually given from the site, from the server, into the, into the browser. This is what initially loads. And it could be something like this, just a simple, you know, the logo, maybe a, a nav up top, and then everything else might not be there at, at that time. And then the JavaScript loads in, you know, all the additional content onto the page after that initial load. So this is what I would say is dynamic website. And this can be done by a variety of, of different frameworks. Uh, you could use Ajax, which really kind of started this off. Uh, jQuery, uh, AngularJS, Ember, um, and you know, uh, ReactJS as well. And so there's, there's many other ones out there uh, that you can do this with. So, and you know, each one has its pluses and minuses, 
and each one can be optimized. Um, so the question is, what do we do with all this dynamic website stuff? You know, first, you know, you can create dynamic content. Um, you know, this page looks like, you know, pretty an ordinary page. Um, you know, you have your, your product uh, description, your picture, uh, you know, price, everything on it, just like a normal website. But if you look at the code of it, you know, it's only 69 lines of code, which is amazing when you think of, you know, the thousands of line of code that is usually on a website. Um, and even that with about 20 of this is just, you know, different JavaScript, you know, I, I see add this and uh, some other plugins. So probably the first 40 are actually the only lines of code that is needed on the site. Um, and then, you know, there's other things that you can do like Pinterest. Uh, probably the best example of infinite scrolling you can get. Um, you know, people can spend hours on there just continuing to scroll down. And the, the, the interesting thing is only the first 24 pins are in the source code. The rest are brought in dynamically. And then you, you see different applications, uh, web applications. These are called, you know, single page applications is the official name. And this, you can do anything. In this example, uh, they look up, you know, prices for, for a moving company. And, you know, this one updates the page without a refresh. So you just put in your moving from, where you're moving to, and, and you know, pick your home site. And it tells you exactly, okay, it's this many miles, and then it, it gives you the rest of the uh, information. So the problem that it comes in is how do the search engine robots view your site? You know, it, you know way back in the day, um, you know, Google and Yahoo and other search bots they would just look at the source code and, and that's it. So they wouldn't, they would really miss anything that was JavaScript. And, you know, if so, if it wasn't in the source code, it wouldn't show up in their index and you wouldn't rank for it. But nowadays, you know, Google, yeah, can understand a little bit more about JavaScript. And it, it's made some leaps and bounds. Uh, there was a, a recent article uh, by Adam Audet uh, that he explained how he tested various aspects of JavaScript and seen and gave examples of what they were able to crawl and what they weren't. And you know, for the most part, you know, Google did really well at it. Um, you know, just one thing to note though, he didn't look into ranking factors, and he also didn't go into that much anything that that complex from from what I was able to read on it so um, but you know it's a good start but it still has some some issues um, I've seen from my experience sites that um, you know they had really good rankings they make a big change adding you know some you know angular JS or something else to the site and all of a sudden they come to us saying hey our rankings fall, have fallen, and so what's going on here? And so there's there's still issues today, even with Google being able to crawl those um, those JavaScript pages. And one thing you don't want to forget too is being in Yahoo. I mean, I know majority of the the site search is coming from from Google, but you have to remember Bing doesn't doesn't really do as well as Google does with dynamic content. And you have to remember, uh, Yahoo uses Bing search results. So anything Bing can't crawl, Yahoo can't crawl. And you know, depending on your audience, that could be up to 25% of your organic traffic. So you really don't want to lose that chunk of people. Um, so I want to talk about an example of a site that uh, I've worked with. And they, they had some interesting issues. They, they used a different, uh, they used dynamic, you know, the dynamic contact, I think really a lot of Ajax features to bring in the product information uh, for the, the product page, you know, in dynamically. 
and they were bringing everything in. They, I mean, it was, you know, the the name of the product, the description, the images, related product uh, links, uh, even the page title and meta description were being brought in dynamically, and they were have, <coughs> excuse me, they were having some issues with this, where, you know, year over year they were seeing a, you know around about 10% decline in organic traffic. So it was really hurting them. Um, so we did uh, in a test where we removed the Ajax from those product pages. And within a week, we started seeing Google, uh, their rankings increase and their traffic increase by 13%. And that was just the in that first week. Um, something to really notice though, is Bing. Bing had a really hard time understanding that content. And so those the traffic really tanked in the past. So when we made this change, they saw a 106% increase in traffic, which really blew us away. I, I mean, before that point, I knew Bing had issues, but I didn't know it was that, that bad. And then similar, you know, Yahoo saw an increase of 72%. Um, so in the same line of being. So definitely being is not in the same ballpark as, as Google is. And also if, if you're working on any international sites, you might come up with other search engines that are dominant in that area. So you really have to be careful of what, what kind of technology you use on the site because not everyone is up to par with, with Google's uh, uh, search uh, crawling. Um, so now we're going to kind of talk about, okay, what's the problem? What, what kind of issues can you find or can you see with, you know, the uh, dynamic content or dynamic websites? And the first thing is, you know, what we see and what the search engines see are a lot of times different. Uh, here's an example, you know, I did a, a fetch as Google uh, for this site. And initially, you know, the content was really gone. Um, you couldn't see anything. You couldn't, uh, they couldn't interact with it. You know, all we saw was that little pop up there, new move, uh, moving New York City. That, that was it. That's all that Google could see. Um, and, but, you know, there was much more to the page. And what was really concerning to me was also the navigation for the site was was bad. So not that not only affects this page, but it affects all these other pages that it's linked to. Because if Google's looking for different links off of this page to, to crawl the rest of the site and they can't find it, they might not be able to find that those other pages. And also that you lose that link authority that you would get from your different internal links on your site. So another important thing to realize that you want to make sure not only your content shows up, but also your navigation. Um, so this is a, another interesting uh, uh, one. This is a more of a, another web, web app, but with this one, you really can't, there, there's no browsing. Um, it's really simple. It's, it's really search centric. Um, so the search, and search engines really don't go in and, and do searches on their own uh, because you could have some really weird um, results from that. And this one, you know, let's say, okay, I do actually do a search. Um, yeah, and you know, like I said here, search engines really don't know what to do with this. So I do a search for Seattle, find any Seattle hotels, because, you know, I'm familiar with that. So uh, first the thing that happens is this pop down shows up. Okay, what what kind of, what area in Seattle? So, I, okay, I picked downtown. Uh, then it asked me, okay, what, when do you want to show up? When, what's your check-in and check-out date? Okay, you know, then I finally get to the content of the site here. You know, so there's no way that a search engine would be able to do that on its own. Uh, uh, you know, you know, the only way it would be able to do that is if Google finally perfected their you know, artificial intelligence. But we're hopefully a, a far way away from there. 
Um, another thing that is a problem where I, I mentioned it already is it's dynamic content is not the greatest for navigation, um, especially if you you have to interact with the page to see the next level of navigation. So you might have a, a site like this where you know it's basic. You know you have one page and links to a few, and then they link to a few more. Um, if you have any issues with you know, Google or Bing not being able to understand your links, you know, the number of pages indexed is going to be an issue because they're not going to be able to find them. Um, and that's, and that's going to really cause, you know, indexing to go bad and your rankings to fall. Um, and this is even if those pages at the end there are not even dynamic. Uh, those can be, you know, give, give the servers and, and people you know, a, a whole HTML version of the page that's easily be easily, sorry, easily readable. But if the search engines can't get to it, then your rankings are going to fall uh, or not exist at all. So th there's issues with that. So you want to make sure that one that the pages are browsable. Um, and when all these problems happen, first thing, yeah, rankings they tank um, and then along with that your customers or or other traffic to the website it tanks as well and that's usually when somebody gives me a call and say hey what what's going on we just launched this new website and all our rankings are gone and so you know that's that's the issue now to, to be fair you know there's probably some websites with you know making with these types of technology that are fine. But, you know, people are only coming to me when there's a problem. So I'm seeing a lot of the issues. Uh, there's probably some that are, are fine, but, you know, I don't usually see those as much. So, and I wanna tell you, it's, it's not all that bad. Um, I don't wanna say, okay, you can't, don't use AngularJS, don't use Ajax for anything. That That's not the way that we wanna do it, because, you know, Realistically, people that just spent tons of money making a new site, they don't want to have to go back to the drawing board and start over. Um, it's That's usually not possible. And the good thing is we can fix a majority of these things, uh, if not all of them. So what, what can you do? Uh, the first thing is take a look at, at Google's you know, you know, developer site here. They have a whole list of best practices of what to do. It goes into much more detail than I can at, at this point. Um, but you know like you said like you could see here, making Ajax applications crawlable. you know perfect. And that also goes along with any of the Angular JS or other other uh, frameworks. It's the same concepts. So um, you know the big thing is making sure that search engines are not blocked uh, from seeing your content. So here's an example. You can say, oh, okay, the, I'm pointing at the screen here, so. Uh, in the uh, you know, top corner, you can see, okay, the, uh, the person's not showing up for the nearest store. The address isn't showing up at the bottom. And you know, so you can see, okay, something's wrong there. Nice thing about using Fetch as Google, you scroll down, and it tells you exactly what is blocked. And so in this case, you can see, okay, the images to that manager photo is, not, is, is blocked, and that Ajax script is also blocked. And so it's perfect, it tells you what, what to do. Because Google's really trying to help you get visible as well. Um, so then if you go in further and click that robots.txt tester link there, it takes you to your robots.txt file and it shows you exactly which line is blocking that content. So it's a great tool to really and really quick and easily debug that. So there should be no issues. And and this is kind of a, a change of you know the old way of of thinking where we used to block all the JavaScript, all the CSS and even some of the images from search engines because it would show up funky on the search results. 
But nowadays we have to switch our way of thinking and really show Google everything that has to do with rendering that page or rendering the site. If you don't do it, they're not going to be able to see that content. Another thing that Google talks about in their best practices is HTML snapshots. Now, this, this is an interesting, to, uh, interesting thing which not a lot of people understand completely. Uh, to put it simply, when you want to show Google a different version of the site than uh, you're showing your, your, your normal customers. Now, this gets tricky because you can get into some issues with, you know, um, with cloaking, so you want to be careful. But you want to, what it does is you try to offer up Google an HTML version that's not dynamic back instead of all the JavaScript version that you give your, your regular uh, customers and, and users. So um, what, you're, what you want is it to look exactly like what, what you see, but it's just an HTML version that's already pre-rendered. So that way Google has no issues with the JavaScript. Uh, and so it makes it much easier for them to crawl and understand what's going on on the, on the page. Now, there's some easy ways to do this because if you ever try to code it, code one of those snapshots by yourself, you know, you could probably tell, tell it's, it takes a long time to do it yourself. Um, so other services have popped up recently to do this for you. You know, NPM, Ajax Snapshot, Brombone, are just a few of these. But what they make it really easy and the cost is pretty pretty minimal for, for what they give you. And so they what they'll do is they they'll crawl your site, create those HTML snapshots, and then you can tie into their their system by an API and grab those and serve them automatically to the search engines. So it makes it much easier to give those search engines an HTML version of your of your site. So it and you know what it's one thing that you know Google says in their uh, best practices to do. So definitely want to do it. You know I, I've heard recently that you know Google might be going away from those best practices but still like I said before being uh, Yahoo, other um, you know smaller search engines are not as advanced. So even if Google goes away from the HTML snap snapshots, you want to do it for those other search engines. Um, another thing is you want to make browsable path pathways, like in this version of the uh, Room 77 77 hotel search here. You know, it's real easy for the for the human to go and do some searches, but where's the robot going to go? to find, uh, find what's on the site. How do they browse it? Um, and on this, this page they have, okay, you go down to the footer and you can say, okay, there's Seattle Hotels. I'm gonna choose that. And then you go to the page, you can, oh, there's the content I'm looking for. And this, these pages are really browsable by the search engines. And you know, it's, per it's perfect for them. And then you also see on the side, there's more browsable content that they can get to. Now, this, this page itself isn't perfect because it only shows for Seattle uh, 10, 10 hotels. And I know there's a lot more hotels in Seattle than that. Um, so, you know, th there's the see all hotels button at the top and the bottom, but that just takes you to the uh, one page application again. So, and th they're not doing the, the best there. And another thing is, uh, this only shows the very popular searches. What about the not so popular ones? What if I want to go to Portland? What if I want to go to uh, Sacramento, California? What, what about those cities? Um, I can bet you that the site's not ranking well for, for those other cities because the search engines can't get to that content. Um, so another thing that will help is to create XML sitemaps. And what, what this will do is it will help Google find those pages that it might have trouble finding. Now, one thing 
to note, this is not a replacement for internal linking. You know, these XML sitemaps are not going to give you any, uh, you know, link juice or link value uh, for, you know, that your normal internal linking would do. So it, it's a good thing to, to help the search engines find those pages, but, you know, it's not a replacement for getting those that good internal browsable linking. Um, the next thing you can do is use dynamic functionality sparingly. You know, think about what you really need to use it on the site for. You know, do you really, do you really need to dynamically feed your page title and meta description? You know, really? You know, and also don't use, you know, loading the stuff after the initial page load as a band-aid. I've, I've heard a lot of sites that they use this because, oh, they have, their page load speed is really bad. Um, and so they want to be able to do the initial load and then have the rest load, you know, uh, load, load next. And so the user can, can see the logo and navigation real quickly. But that, that's a bad thing because it still takes forever for your main content to load. And that's what the people came here to the site to see. And also, you know, just just do the uh, just fix the things that you need to get done first. Fix that page load speed. Um, most of the time, that will hurt you in the long run, anyways. Um, you know, if your database is slow, fix that. If your images are not optimized, fix that. There's a lot of things you can do before you use the dynamic content to help things get quicker. Um, another thing is, uh, go slow, you know, test things out. You don't have to do, redesign your entire site using AngularJS or anything else at the, all at one time. I would definitely test things out with one section at a time and then see how the search engines react to it. And get things dialed in before you start on the next section. And that way you can make sure that everything is going smooth, that you're not losing tons of traffic. And uh, so that's kind of all I have for my, my webinar today. Um, so if you have any questions, feel free to uh, you know, ask them on the uh, webinar here. I'll let uh, turn this back over to Colin. Thanks, Ken. That was extremely informative and I think definitely leaves a lot of questions open since we can't get into each framework or technique here. Uh, but we can certainly do some of that in questions if you guys want to drill down on some specific topics while we're here. Um, so don't forget all the resources Ken referenced will be available in a follow-up blog post on Portent.com. And let's open it up for questions and answers. I know we had a lot of them. Some of them actually came from inside of Portent as our, uh, our lead developer. Uh, was uh, was picking at some of the things that uh, Ken was saying because of all of the UX improvements that are often offered by going with a dynamic framework and serving um, all of your content within a much more limited space or a single page. Mm -hmm. um, so let's uh, let's start with uh, actually this is a great one. So whether or not Ken, you think there is a uh, a right or uh, kind of a best practice as far as all of these. Um, dynamic uh, website creation techniques goes between Ajax, Angular, Ember, um, or is it just a matter of you know any of them, whichever serves the need best, but continuing to go through the process you outlined here? Is there a right answer? You know, not really. There, it can be, you know, you could use all of them and optimize all of them just, just fine. Um, one thing that I know different developers have pointed out to me is, you know, AngularJS, it was created by Google, so why can't why can't they crawl that? And it's true, it, it, it was created by Google, but it, it if you don't optimize it, you're still gonna have issues. So either way you go on this, you could still have issues with if you don't fully optimize the, the site for it. And a lot of times when I've seen problems, people aren't following those basic best practices that Google has laid out for them. I think that's a great place to leave that. And of course, we're happy to debate uh, if anybody wants to get into whether there's one or another that's uh, that's better for pure SEO purposes. Mm -hmm. um, 
so let's take another question from uh, within GoToWebinar. Uh, so Ed asks, uh, my site uses normal HTML except for the header, which has a jQuery slider using lazy load, good for you, Ed, uh, mm -hmm. to load images. Uh, have you seen issues with sliders loading images dynamically? Hmm. Yeah, I, I haven't really seen any issues with that. Images are a little bit different than you know the regular content. Um, with the big big thing is if you're you know lazy loading those images, I, I don't see an issue really. Uh, the big thing is if if any content links, especially in your navigation, are not sh being brought in initially, that could be an issue. But you know it. Like I said, I, I'd have to see the site to see see what's going on, but I, I really don't see a problem with loading images like that. That's not an issue. I think it's a great place to leave that. There's not necessarily anything fundamentally wrong with it. It's all about what you described, which is go slow and test, test, test. Exactly. Uh, so let's go to the next question. Anna actually, uh, this is great. So Anna commented, and this is right, that Google recently announced it may discontinue its Ajax uh, crawlable guidelines. Mm -hmm. um, we will probably include the, uh, the link to the article that she shared uh, right. in, the, uh, in the notes here uh, as a follow-up. But uh, the, the question is really, do you still recommend Ken using HTML snapshots in light of that announcement? Yeah, yeah, definitely I would still recommend it. Um, you know, the, the Google, you know, announcement, it wasn't really a real announcement. They mentioned it in a, you know, a, a webinar that they were doing. Um, but it wasn't anything official at this point. Will that be going away soon? Possibly. Um, so I think Google's still getting to the point where they're perfecting their rendering techniques, and that might not be needed for Google. But the other search engines definitely still need it. Like I showed in my example, Bing had a huge issues with some basic Ajax uh, calls. And you know they're gonna continue to have issues with some of this complicated coding. So I'd say maybe not as much for Google, but definitely for Bing and some of the other smaller um, search engines. I think that's great. Uh, I'm gonna give a quick nudge to Marjorie. Uh, I'd love to answer that question, Marjorie. You asked if those browsable pages are static. Can you give a little bit more elaboration there? And we'll get back to that question in just a minute. Um, we'll go on to, uh, to Matt. Uh, who asks, should browsable pathways lead to the same URLs as the dynamic pages themselves? If you can, definitely yes. Um, other things you can do is you can use uh, canonical tags to lead back to the, uh, the non-dynamic version of the page as well. So in a perfect world, yeah, you want it to use the same URLs, but I know sometimes that's not possible. So you can use different workarounds like canonical tags um, and another thing, so. I, I think that's a great question, Matt, and that kind of gets also back to the idea of distance from perfect. You know, there, there's the ideal solution, and then there's the one that's actually accommodated, accommodated by the infrastructure that you've built, the needs that you need to serve, the, the business goals for the specific page that you're building. And so that becomes kind of a case-by-case -case thing, but Ken, I think that's a great answer. And Matt, thank you for that question, that was great. Uh, so David asks, uh, have you had issues with keeping pre-render cache clean, quote unquote, uh, for example, inclusive of only canonical URLs? And if so, uh, how do you cope with that? Um, I, on that one, I'm not really sure what, what he's talking about. Uh, I haven't run into that issue, so at this point I can't, can't answer that one. But if you uh, give me a uh, follow-up email or, or a tweet uh, and talk a little bit more about it, and I, I'm definitely willing to follow up on that one. Yeah, and when, when Horton approaches problems like this, what we'll typically do is bring in uh, our, our lead developer along with uh, an SEO to tackle this, because in a lot of cases, you know, you get, you're getting beyond SEO here. Mm -hmm. uh, you're talking about straight up site performance, which definitely impacts SEO. Uh, we've done some research that uh, got picked up uh, about the, uh, the impact that site speed actually does have on your ranking. That's pretty common as well. Um, but what you're talking about with uh, keeping your cache clean for page speed, that definitely is kind of a cross-functional question. Um, one that we'd be happy to, to go into a little bit more. Uh, so 
David, thank you for that question. Let's go back to, to Marjorie really quickly. So uh, Marjorie, Marjorie was looking specifically under the browsable pathways topic. Um, popular search pages were suggested. Mm -hmm. So are those static pages? You know, for, for this example, I didn't look into it too much, but I believe they were static. Uh, there might be some dynamic elements to them, but for the most part, you know, the, the basic idea for that is with, you need to be able to get the search engine to, uh, to those pages. Even if they are dynamic, you still need to get them there. So that's a very important part of creating that browsable pathway is being able to allow the search engines to find those pages and then be able to render them from that point. That's a great question. Um, go back here and so we've got a question from Karthik next and Karthik apologies if I've mispronounced that uh, do you have any suggestions on using prerender.io as SEO crawl as an SEO uh, crawlability solution for dynamic content and that one is a little bit beyond me uh, so well Karthik I'll, I'll, I'll jump in really quickly and say um, you know Pre-fetching or pre-rendering is something that we are actively exploring here uh, at Porton. Uh, it's not something I think we're ready to talk about just yet. There's going to be uh, an ebook coming out in a little bit around uh, site speed, site performance, uh, and that's going to be a major topic there. Mm -hmm. So I'll have to leave it with that teaser and say yes, that's you know that's the kind of thing that I think people are going to be well served to look at uh, as the need for perceived lightning fast page load speed um, increases. The, uh, the the expectation from your users is probably that your site be getting faster and faster and faster, which is where a lot of this dynamic content comes in handy and becomes uh, just something where you need to watch out for what it does to your organic traffic. Mm -hmm. So we'll come back to that for sure, Karthik, and that's a great question, thank you. Uh, Anna asks, can we share the uh, the resource for the, uh, the page speed impact on SEO? Yeah, the, the two that jump to mind, Anna, and I'll, I'll just reference them now, and we'll uh, try to include these in the uh, in the webinar notes. Um, so Ian Lurie, our founder and CEO, has done a couple of decks. My personal favorite is called Distance from Perfect, uh, where you talk about the, uh, the holistic quality of your site, of which site speed is a huge indicator, uh, and what that actually does to um, Google's perception of how valuable your page actually is beyond just the uh, the relevance factors like what content is there and, and you know what your meta descriptions say, uh, and then the other one is uh, is an article by uh, Michael Wiegand, Tim Gilman, and Ian Lurie where we looked at a broad cross section of websites, uh, specifically and largely in e-commerce, uh, to determine what the correlation between site speed. Uh, and conversion rate slash revenue actually was. Uh, that's a great article. Um, that basically shows you across the uh, the, sa the site sample, um, when you shave a second here and a second there, the jump in conversion rate from like, I think it's five seconds to three, three to two, uh, two to one, and so on. And we'll try to include that in the show notes as well. Uh, David uh, asked, uh, just clarifying, uh, if you set up a service to serve HTML snapshots of pages, there's a cache of HTML snapshots and the URLs they'll be served against. So these URLs can have a campaign per, uh, can have campaign parameters and other weird things appended to the canonical URLs. Hmm. Um, David will follow up with Ken, but if Ken, you've got any additional thoughts here before we take it to the Twitters? Yeah, there, there's. Definitely, it can create some ugly URLs with uh, those different uh, parameters on there. Uh, there's some different ways. Um, yeah, I'll uh, I'll follow up with you, David, or, or uh, you know, kind of uh, reach out to me on Twitter, and I'll I'll answer that uh, a little bit more specific. Outstanding. So I think we're getting to the end. We might take one more question before we let everybody get back to their day. Uh, feel free to shoot that in on Goods Webinar. We'll check Twitter just really quickly. It looks like we're good on Twitter, so we'll get one more from the uh, the Goods Webinar pane. Um, oh, this is a great one. Uh, this is a little bit more fundamental SEO, but since we know we've got a lot of developers uh, on the uh, on the webinar today, let's ask this one. Um, 
Ken, you talked about cloaking. What What is cloaking, mm. and how can you avoid it as you're actually building a dynamic application? Okay, so <clears throat> when we talked about um, setting up the HTML snapshot, which is basically a copy of your page that's already pre-rendered, um, just a, a separate version of it. So what you want to make sure is if you if you serve the, ser the search engine something different where the content changes, um, then that would be considered cloaking. Now, you're gonna have some minor changes in the content when you do the, uh, the snapshot, but what we're talking about is anything that's really intentionally deceptive. So, you know, the you know, initial thing of cloaking where was where people were you know, trying to get traffic to a site uh, for one keyword, and then when people got to it, they found out it was for something totally different. So maybe you were doing a, a search for, you know, truck accessories, and you landed onto the site, and it was nothing but Viagra. So that's the bait and switch that cloaking talks about in the, the big thing. But you want to just make sure that you're as close as possible to the content that you share with the search engines that you are with the normal users. So you want to make sure that everything is on that page. You want to make sure the, the navigation is included. You want to make sure the, the uh, title and the, the you know, heading title, the uh, page title, meta description, all that is in, is in there and matches up with what the uh, normal people, when they come to the site, what they see. That's a great one, and I think that's probably a great place for us to leave it. So that gets back to some more SEO fundamentals. Uh, if you guys are interested in doing a little bit more with the fundamentals on SEO, we've got a, a video series out on YouTube that, uh, that Ian Lurie, our founder, has been, uh, has been putting out. Uh, I think it's a lot of fun, just little bite-sized uh, pieces if you guys wanna get into you know, what is cloaking, uh, you know, what, are, uh, what are rich text snippets, things like that. Okay, uh, so don't forget that if you have any more questions for Ken, you can tweet them directly to him at uh, Kejako. I don't even know how you pronounce that. K-E-J-A-C-O. Uh, or you can tweet them to, uh, to at Porton. And if you'd like, make sure you use that hashtag PortonU. Uh, and then just a reminder again, today's webinar and the presentation slides, all those links will be coming your way uh, tomorrow in a follow-up email as well as on the blog. Uh, so next month, I uh, hope you guys can join us for our June webinar. Uh, we're going to take a step back from SEO, uh, which is actually, shockingly, not all we do here at Porton. Porton is a fully integrated digital marketing agency. Uh, we're going to have our awesome PPC team get back to some PPC fundamentals and strategy uh, that you should really be considering in 2015, knowing that not all of us live that uh, all day every day, but definitely need to be uh, fluent in it so that you can work with your colleagues across the aisle. Okay, uh, as always, if you don't want to wait to sign up for that next webinar, you'll be able to do that via portent.com or you can use the webinar tab on our Facebook page, which is facebook.com slash portent.marketing. Thanks everyone, we'll see you next time. Appreciate all the great questions and have a great day.